could be proven. Danger is an integral part of rock climbing. Some climbers say it's half the fun. But those dangers can be minimized by the observation of safety precautions and the use of strong, durable ropes and equipment. Even if things go wrong, there should be something or someone to hang on to. But what if a climber leaves home without all that safety backup, without companions even, and takes on the rock face alone? Nobody is going to live forever, so why not do the things that really give you a kick when you're still young and able to do them? I tell my tightest moments of being free climbing, because then you you prepare to to push yourself to the absolute limit when you're actually about to fall off. Um, I'm basically a fatalist in my beliefs, in that I believe that if you're going to die, it doesn't matter what you're doing; your time is set. I think of dying. You know, I mean, I think I think of dying, but it's not a reason for me to climb. I'm not a kamikaze climber. You have to concentrate entirely on what you're doing. If your concentration breaks, that can be your downfall. It can be, it can end your your life. No, I'm not scared of dying. I'm not scared of dying. Where do you think you're going? Don't you know it's wild? You can't go in alone. You'll die on your own. I know what you're thinking. That you can be free. You chase your one-way ticket. You bargain your return. The solo ascent is something that even seasoned climbers would rather not think about. So it is not surprising that the South African climbing community was stunned five years ago when Chris Lomax broke through all the barriers and began climbing the most difficult routes, free of equipment and alone. You ride along the highway, you dare to break the rules. You better go with me Climbers in a rock face will usually be employing one of two methods. With mechanical climbing, the climber uses the equipment to hang from, whereas in free climbing, the equipment is used for protection only, say in the event of a fall, leaving the climber hands-on contact with the rock. High tech in high places has seen the piton largely replaced by new gadgets. Expanding nuts called friends and small steel micro wedges. This has made climbing safer but for some, the challenge has been reduced. Yeah, that looks pretty thin. No, that looks good. That looks amazing. <laughs> so good, man! Yes! Looking really good, Tim. A leading South African climber at 23, Chris has been climbing for 10 years. 10 years that have seen him at the top in the Alps, South America, Alaska, and the Himalayas, where, with David Davies, he conquered a previously unclimbed 6,500-meter peak. Back home in Cape Town, the climbing prospects are not so spectacular. One of the main reasons why Chris took up the solo challenge.
once attempted with all the paraphernalia of the rock climber take on a new dimension when the climber goes solo. Without equipment, without friends, the power of the mind as well as muscle becomes a vital resource, one that can only be developed by years of climbing experience. My first solo climb was when I was about 6, 15, 16, and it probably wasn't very safe because I didn't have that many years of climbing behind me. But I'm fortunate enough to have, to have come through that, that period where a lot of guys don't come through that period. A lot of guys, a lot of, a lot of guys climbing roped get killed in their first two years of climbing. That's the most dangerous part of climbing is the first two years. For the solo climber, a mistake leaves no room for a second chance. To the non-climber, the risks taken in the solo ascent seem, to say the least, unnecessary. Solo climbers, I think, are insane, really. I mean, to risk their lives for... for what? My ego, which is what it's actually all about. It's a personal ego that you enjoy stimulating. You do it for yourself, and you do it alone. There are no cheering crowds, no trophies, not even a friend to share the experience. So why do it? Put simply, it comes down to a greater sense of being alive. For Tony Dick, an experienced climber, an alpinist, going solo is a logical step up. He's not a reckless character who goes out and jumps over the edge of a cliff. He assesses the risk and he decides to conquer it. From that, he runs the risk of a shorter life. But his life is finite anyway. So he takes the decision to add some value to his life by conquering that risk. So I would say that's what the solo climber gets from it. He gets a lot nearer to his own physical and mental limits. When I start soloing, I immediately start talking to myself and telling myself to just to be safe and just to keep a cool head. And that's, I think that's the crux of all soloing, you have to have a hell of a cool head. And when I started on this pitch, um, I sort of sat at the bottom for a bit and thought about it for a bit. And then I get a bit impatient at, at sitting around and I, uh, eventually I come to a decision that I have to go for it. And I went for it. You ride along the highway You dare to break the rules Where do you think you're going? I'd rather have somebody else on the end of my rope than to actually go sailing. I have sailed it, but uh, I just scared too easily for it. Um, I realize that it's like death. Ed <laughs> February is one of the country's leading rock climbers. There are, however, a handful of climbers that do occasionally solo. At 16, Andrew de Klerk has already made several major solo ascents. When I first started off solo climbing, it was to gain recognition from the older climbers. But I think now that I have um, gained recognition, I solo for the pure pleasure of being able to move without ropes. The most ethical way of climbing is just being free and just to climb the way God made me to climb. Well, my first big solo climb was called Little Winterhoek. In 1961, Hans Kraflund soloed the Klein Winterhoek frontal. And in those days, solo climbing was totally out of bounds. As a result, when I did this climb, I had a lot of adverse flack from then the leading climbers in South Africa. It was not the done thing, but it was worth everything. The emotions I had in this route, the freedom I had, uh, just on my own in these verticals, is an experience I'll never forget. All the other climbs I did after that, with people or without people, never were the same as that particular solo climb, Little Winterhook. I think when I was on top, I was dancing, I was shouting, and I was so happy. I've never been like that in my whole life before. And I think I never will be.
The mental demands in a solo climber are so draining that Chris usually makes a major solo ascent about once every three months. Most weekends you'll find him hanging out with his friend Kevin Smith, relaxing on the most extreme routes and pushing through new ones. Whoa, guys! Oh, That's it. Got your four, boys. Got your four out. Looking for some way to make it clear. Whoa! Whoa! Okay, now get your right hand quickly, sir. Okay, can we get it on the no other way around? No, it looks like that. Solo climbing is all in the mind, but control over his emotions. Chance events can still place his life at risk. Changing weather, loose rocks, or a rock that comes away in your hand. If I had to die tomorrow, I'd be totally satisfied because I've actually had a very nice life up until this moment. So it doesn't worry me that much. The thing that worries me about dying is the way that I'm going to die. If I'm going to suffer for a long time, or if it's going to be quick. This climb, known as roulette, is evidence enough of the solo climber's willingness to gamble on high stakes. Only a few years ago, it was the most difficult route on Table Mountain. It breaks through a series of overhangs, and on this traverse, the climber is forced to lean back and has to rely completely on one handhold as he moves the other hand. Once past this, he faces a section even more daunting, even more overhanging and exposed. The overhanging crack is a, it's a crack which leans back at, a, at an angle of about 45 degrees and consists of jugs, which you swing from, you swing from jug to jug just hanging from your arms um, with your feet jammed into the crack. On that pitch, if, if, if a handle does break, you have no chance of, of recovering yourself in the event of a fall. Even the top rock climbers using equipment consider this pitch as one of the most serious and difficult grades. For the solo climber, his commitment has to be total. If you fell off a left, you'd, you'd be killed. You'd fall from the other end, crack, you'd probably fall about 200 feet. And that would be it.
In the heart of the Toys Kloof, the Cape Mountains hide the solo climber's greatest challenge, the northwest rock wall of the Toys Peak. At the head of a remote valley, the huge and ominous wall rises vertically for 600 meters, three times the height of Johannesburg's Carlton Center. There are essentially four routes on the face. They are seldom climbed. Chris will attempt a solo ascent of the north by northwest route, a route that follows up the center of the face. as lifeline, an umbilical cord to safety. On a rock wall like this one, it is all he has to help him out of trouble. Using a rope, he will be able to retrace his steps and get back down. Leaving the rope behind means that Chris's commitment to the face is total. The only way out is up. The northwest face was first climbed in 1949 and since then has only yielded another three routes, all of them difficult and serious climbs. North by northwest is probably the classic extreme route in southern Africa. Even the most experienced of climbers using equipment and ropes would regard a successful ascent of this route as a major achievement. The first 200 meters are of a moderate grade, but from here the climb becomes more and more difficult, breaking out diagonally left across the smooth slabs and through the massive red overhangs to the top of the tower. On this route, there is no turning back for Chris. The moves would be impossible to reverse without a rope. has to be total concentration, total control of one's emotions. There is no time to consider the thought of failure. Suspended beyond outside help, in another world, in the middle of a solo ascent, the mind can always play tricks, if you let it. Perhaps the secret of solo climbing is mind control. 
you have to be in charge of both body and spirit. On reaching this, the last pitch, it would have been far more dangerous to have tried to retreat back down. And I, I didn't climb with any rope. I was climbing entirely on my own ability. And I had to sit there and think about whether I was going to try and down climb the sort of 1,200 feet below me or climb the last 150 feet. And that was sort of the big, the big decision of whether I was actually going to make it or not. And I sat for about an hour and thought about it all and thought about life and thought about what living is all about and thought about how one's values in life are always improved by the things that you do in life which you enjoy. Um, you're going to die solo climbing at the age of 22 or 16 or whatever the age might, might be. And that's also great because you're doing things you want to do in life. But on reaching the top, I was totally elated that I had actually overcome my mental fear weakness and had, had succeeded in conquering it. <laughs>